where do the rights that a landlord or a tenant have come from? Predominantly, they're going to come from the rental agreement, the contract. So quite frequently when a client says, can I do this or can I do that or can the landlord do this or the landlord do that or charge me this or that, my first response is going to be, well, what does the lease say? What does the contract say? Um, a, a contract is simply a private agreement between two parties that sets forth rights and responsibilities that those parties have. Um, it's often the case that things are left out of a contract. So a contract is not necessarily going to be all inclusive or comprehensive, but it should hopefully be as, um, as comprehensive as possible. In a rental agreement, a rental agreement can be either verbal or written. It doesn't have to be written. Um, any rental agreement that intends to last for longer than a year has to be in writing to be enforceable. So if you have a verbal agreement that you can stay here as long as you want, you know, but that agreement's not in writing, then the law is going to treat that as a month to month rental agreement. But it's still a rental agreement, even though it's verbal. Uh, the rental agreement should set out what the rent is, what property is being leased, what the due date for the rent is. Those are probably the three fundamental um, requirements that you need to have a basic, basic rental agreement. Um, now, in addition to the rental agreement, there's also the Residential Landlord Tenant Act. There are also some common, what are called common law rules, which are basically just rules that courts have developed over time to make decisions in, in various cases. And that's generally called the law. And the law can fill in certain gaps. So let's say that there's a conflict in your lease agreement about what your rent, uh, rent due date is. Let's say that part one, at one point in the rent agreement, it says your rent is due on the first, but then at another point in the rent agreement, it says the rent is due by the end of the previous month. Well, the natural interpretation of that would be that it's due by the last day of the previous month. So there's a discrepancy there. So a common law rule that the courts have developed is that if there's a, if there's a conflict in terms or what's called an ambiguity, the courts are going to construe that ambiguity against the drafter of the document. So in the, most often the drafter is going to be the landlord. So the court should find that the due date in this hypothetical scenario is the first of the month, um, since that would be the construction against the drafter. But the Residential Landlord Tenant Act and common law sort of fill in the gaps when the rental agreement either doesn't address something or if the rental agreement has a provision that is prohibited by law. So as an example, landlords are required to maintain, to, to, to make certain maintenance um, or to maintain the property, not entirely, but they're supposed to maintain the big things, you know, plumbing systems, electrical systems, um, you know, if the door gets damaged or taken off the hinges, that's the landlord's issue. So the landlord often cannot put onto the tenant the obligation to maintain the fitness of the property or to maintain the habitability of the property. The tenant does have obligations, which we'll talk about, but the Residential Landlord Tenant Act would trump any lease provision that contradicts the Residential Landlord Tenant Act.